and welcome to 3Q The Artist, the podcast designed to go beyond the typical artist interview by asking three questions in just 15 minutes. I'm your host, Rachel Vogel, and joining me for tonight's episode is the band Girlfriends. So before we get started, just want to say welcome to the show. Thank you both for being here. Excited to jump into these questions. First, I'd love if you could share a bit about how the two of you came together and what the journey as a band has been like over the last few years, especially after coming off of the huge success that was Girlfriends, the album. What has it been like kind of building off of that momentum together? It all started off Instagram, really. Uh, Just like one DM. Um, Nick posted a, a story behind his drum set saying that he missed touring and I was literally driving in my car and I felt the exact same way. You know, I'd taken a hiatus from making my own music for a few years. And when I saw it, I literally picked up my phone and and called him and was like, we should do something together. And I think, I don't know, like a a couple days later, um, we met up at his studio at the Noise Nest and started playing each other like bands that we loved, inspiration, like music, and, you know, just kind of what we heard the band being uh, in its like infant stages. It was a lot of uh, Celine Dion and, and Cher initially, and um, it gradually evolved to something else. That's awesome. I feel like that's usually how the best the best relationships start through the Instagram DM. <laughs> <laughs> All right, jumping into the first main question. I've heard many artists say, I am my music and my music is me. So what does that statement mean to you both individually and as a duo? Yeah, I think you want to you want to live through your music. You want to be able to get up on stage every single day and authentically breathe and and live and play the songs that that you write and that mean the most to you. Um, and to try not to st- stray too far away from that. Um, and I think that's the constant quest of of continuing to be in a band and making music. And at the end of the day, doing it for yourself and for nobody else. Yeah, I'll be controversial for a second and say that. I don't necessarily agree with that. Like I am my music and my music is me. I think music is a product of who you are. It's a, it's a byproduct of who you are and what you've been through. Like, but you know, there are songs that I wrote eight years ago that I don't relate to anymore, you know, but like I had to write those songs to get to the next chapter of who I was becoming. So I think if anything, it's a snapshot into who you are and where you are at that time. Um, but that's the cool thing about about making music is you get to look at it like a journal entry, right? And when you flip through these, these songs, you get to remember where you were, who you were with, what you were going through. Um, and in a way, like as you get older and you mature and you grow, um, the songs, like th- those, those meanings change as well and it evolves over time. Yeah, totally. I feel like it's a great, great way to look back. If you don't have home videos, you have your songs. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So over the last few years, you've supported quite a few legendary artists on tour with another exciting run coming up this summer with Avril Lavigne. So I'm curious, what's the best part of performing live shows, both the pre-show and the post-show? And what are some of the steps that you both take to stay both mentally and physically prepared? I think my favorite part about performing is the 60 seconds before you go on stage and you're kind of be, you're, you're behind the stage, you know, and there's just like this feeling when your in-ears are in and, you know, you can hear the crowd behind the curtain and you know that you're, you know, you're about to go on, on stage in front of thousands of people, right. Who might not necessarily know who you are, who might love your band. Like you just never know how it's going to go. And that uncertainty really forces you to live in the moment. And I don't know, I like to like kind of get down and touch the ground and just go through some things in my head. And we all kind of have a huddle and we say one thing that we're grateful for. And we just go out there and and make it the best, you know, 30, 45 minutes hour of our life. And yeah, it's just, there's nothing in life that comes close to that feeling. And it can't be it can't be replicated. You just have to like experience that and it's addicting. I think Travis definitely said it best there of truly using the experience of playing live in any setting, whether it's with Avril or whether it's doing our own headline shows to just really be in the moment on stage. I think the more you can try and find those kind of things in life that 
bring you into the moment, not living in the past, not living in the future, but just totally locked into what's going on in that moment in time. There's nothing really like playing live or being in music that can do that so well. Um, and so I look forward to that just to kind of get out of my head and get into my, my happy space um, on stage and playing the drum and being on stage with Travis and playing in the band. And um, I look forward to that every single night. Uh, you know, obviously the the bigger the shows, the more the more kind of at stake in different ways of trying to gain new fans versus the ones that are coming there just to see you. And um, it's all a different experience every single time. So it's always pretty fun. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you guys explain that from like an artist perspective, because I feel like fans would almost explain it the same way just from the fan perspective, like being in the moment, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a reciprocal thing, right? It's like you can't have one without the other, because if there was no one watching the show, there would be no reason to get on stage and play the show and you know if there was no one going on stage no one would be there like watching so it is a you can't have one without the other and i think a lot of artists forget that right and there's this like sense of entitlement but like we owe it to everyone watching to leave everything on that stage i feel like you just kind of tapped into the next question so the next question is every industry has its dirty little secrets those can be both positive and negative. What's one secret you would like to share about the music industry? Probably that it's just, it's not all bells and whistles all the time. I mean, I think it's the, you get that. 90% of the time it's not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the 60, 60 minutes on stage or, or even less in a lot of circumstances for us. But um, yeah, it's everything in between, you know, that actually is really, really hard. Um, it's the, it's the driving between shows, you know, it's the trying to figure out the next, you know, batch of content for the month to film, trying to find the next creative idea. It's, it's all the stuff kind of behind the scenes. I think that, um, sometimes isn't always as fun as being able to perform in front of people and being with your fans. But, um, so I think just mentally to be prepared to step into things that aren't always exciting, um, such as life, but, uh, the payoff um, ultimately is, is what it's, uh, you know, makes it all worth it. I think a lot of artists like tour, tour, right. Like you hear a lot of people say like how hard touring is and you know, how draining and you know, how it takes a toll on your mental health while well, that those things may be true. That's like the reward for so many people that make music. And that's something that I'd, I'll say like 99% of artists will never get to experience. Like if you are someone who makes music, who is lucky enough to have built a fan base of people who enjoy what you have made and who will pay money to buy a ticket to go see you in concert. And if like you're complaining about that and you think that that's tough, like you are doing the wrong thing because there are so many musicians that would kill to have 20 people or 100 people, let alone 10,000 people show up to listen to them sing songs that they wrote right and so it's like the the on stage and you know all of that stuff would we'll talk about like the touring that's all the highlight reel and i think to nick's point you know like that's the so many like so few artists get to experience that but i think what people also fail to realize is like for one yes that you get as an artist you you have to hear 99 no's Right. The one tour that we're talking about here, there's 99 other tours that we would have loved to be on that we got told no. Or if the one feature that comes out with a band and another band, you know, or two artists like featuring, like they might have sent that song around to, you know, five other people and got told that the song sucks, that the artist isn't a fan, no one wants to listen to. Like there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. And so there's this like level of persistence that you have to have. You have to almost be delusional. You are going to have people quit on you. You're going to have people not believe in you. You're going to have people tell you awful things about something you love. And I think if you can withstand that, then you have a chance, but it still doesn't guarantee anything. So for the one yes, you know, in your career, it's going to take at least 99 no's. Yeah, totally. I always feel like I constantly tell people in the business that if you hear no, it's like, that doesn't mean no means not now. And maybe that doesn't turn into a yes from that person, but it can be a yes down the line in a brand new situation. So also like, so like, you really have to trust the bigger picture because I mean, even for us, we haven't been a band that long, right? And I mean, I don't think we've accomplished nearly what we've set out to yet, right? Like we were very much in the infant stages still, but there's been things that have happened to Nick and I where, you know, 
they're huge blows in the moment. And, you know, we'll call each other and console each other because it's things that we've really wanted to happen. And we work so hard behind the scenes and it's been managers and agents and, you know, the, like teams of people trying to get something to happen. And it doesn't. And sometimes those it's like at the very last second, you know, like, mm -hmm. like a couple days before something's about to come out or, you know, when you get something and someone tells you yes, and then it's retracted at the last second. And it's just sitting on the phone and being like, hey, remember when we went through this and then look what happened after and this amazing opportunity came up and like, you really you really have to trust the process because if you just react like emotionally or you know instinctually, like you could ruin a lot of good things. All right, think about the stage of life that you are in right now. Then imagine that you're looking in the mirror and all of a sudden you're in your 70s. If you were being interviewed for a retrospective on your career and your life in general, what would you hope to be able to say about each? Um, that I left a positive impact on people. Because I think, yeah, as you... I don't, like what it what is success like it's not numbers it's not streams um it's it's not a dollar amount it's like how you made people feel and i think if you can make them feel good and leave a positive impact i mean that goes way further than you know a number in your bank account or a plaque on the wall or like you you realize quickly too like those things don't make you happy because if they did then we wouldn't have these you know our favorite artists that have that that we've lost too soon right like we wouldn't have the the movies in hollywood that showcase like the trials and tribulations of the biggest superstars in the world so if you can just make people feel good and you can live authentically and do it your way um i think that's success to me yeah success to me is i mean kind of looking back i guess on my career and seeing all the different places on the planet and locations and weird areas that our music was able to take me to um, from a performance perspective. Um, just to think about all the places that I wouldn't have seen right now in my life, thinking about like the Azores Islands playing in a volcanic crater. I would never have gone there if it weren't for being in music and for um, playing in this band. So I think being able to look back on that of all the experiences I was able to have that wouldn't be possible through music, I think is, is a huge success. Um, and obviously, yeah, leaving an imprint on people hard to gauge, you know, what that actually looks like at the end of the day. But, um, you know, if you can kind of change the trajectory of one person's life, I guess that's a success story. Um, and, uh, and yeah, hopefully still have both of my hands to kind of continue to play drums. That's awesome. Well, before we close this out, I do have one final question. I'd love if you guys could share a bit about how you find balance between being an artist and managing other aspects and responsibilities of your day-to-day -day life. I know that Travis, you have your your show with Apple Music. How do you ma manage both? Yeah, I mean, it's. I I, I will say this. Um, my ADHD is my superpower. So I see a lot of people want to kind of, you know, use it as like a scapegoat for whatever they're going through in life. I've kind of turned it like leaned into it and really embraced it. And I think if you can learn how to kind of harness something like that. Um, you can be extremely powerful. And it was really challenging when I was younger and it turned out to be like the biggest blessing of my life. So the fact that I can hyper-focus on a ton of different things at once is really great. Um, not to say that life isn't, you know, stressful and uh, obviously, but everyone's is. So yeah, I, I like my ADHD is definitely a, a superpower. Yeah, I think uh, grateful for the opportunity to be able to do multiple things at once. And I'll lean into what, into what Travis said. Uh, give me all the ADHD possible because I'm going to do as many things as I can while I'm here. So all about it. Love that. Well, we've officially reached the end of the interview. Thank you guys both for being on. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Stay tuned for next week's episode of 3Q The Artist, the podcast that goes beyond the typical artist interview by asking three questions in just 15 minutes. See you then.